When we talk about medication, then I can say if the, this specific pill changed your attention or not, and if it changed it too much, if it brings you to the point of every parent's greatest fear, I have a zombie kid. You that know, was like me. It shut him completely down. So yeah. we can test. We can see it in a five-minute test. Audioversity. The voice of Reichman University. Actually, serious. Amazing conversations from Israel, all topics considered. With Aaron Porras. Welcome to the Actually Serious podcast, where we focus on the most interesting and innovative from Israel with all topics and the humans behind them considered. I'm Aaron Porras, and we're coming at you on Audioversity in partnership with No Camels, the leading site on Israeli innovation news. And today I'm here with my producer, Hannah Rifkin, and Dr. Hadas Shatz Azulai, the COO of Mind Tension, which claims to have a foolproof test for ADHD. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. It was a little, you know, every time someone introduced me and used Dr. Hadas Shatz Azulai, I feel a little... Embarrassed, and I shouldn't, because I just read an article like a few months ago this, uh, about the fact that men, when they introduce themselves, they say, hi, my name is this and that, and right. they use their full name and their full credentials, and women usually just will give you their first name, like, hi, I, hi I'm Hadass, and we shouldn't. It's, I mean, it's, it's like personal. Yeah, but we should use our credentials, and the Absolutely. fact that, so after reading this article, I start introducing myself as Dr. Hadass Shatz as a lie, and, it, and I still feel a little embarrassed to do it, but the fact is, I think just because I feel this way, it's important I keep doing it as a model to my daughter. Absolutely. How, 100%. How old is your daughter? Uh, my daughter is six. Actually, I have five kids. Oh, wow. And I have four boys, uh, six years old. Four boys in six years. The oh oldest, <laughs> the oldest is 21, <laughs> and the youngest is 15. And then I have nine years and a daughter. So, wow, that's wow. amazing. Went back to diapers after they were grown up. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> they must love her so much, though. Uh, she ruled the house. Yeah. So, did you notice? You know, because I grew up with two brothers and then later two stepsisters, and I noticed a, a huge difference between the boy behavior and the girl behavior. How many of them have ADHD? <laughs> uh, well, I think Speaking three. Up. And actually, the girl, I think, has ADHD. Really? We haven't tested her yet because she's young. She's six. Mm-hmm. You usually just test around six or seven. I feel like she does. The, uh, the other ones, two of them might have, but like very uh, low, but they have it. And everyone promised me, you'll have a girl. She'll be calm. She'll be be. She wouldn't climb on everything well she's worse than the boys i mean she climb on everything i can find her on the head of my refrigerator but she's doing it wearing a tutu dress like <laughs> that. <laughs> that's a great picture <laughs> i love that <laughs> well so okay so that 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 kind of brings me into to mind mind tension and this new test and and you kind of touched upon that too that at a certain age, you can't even test for it. And I know that in the United States, at least in, in the West, there's an overdiagnosis issue. It's funny, you know, because I think ADHD is one of these conditions that is at the same time overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed. And it's, it's kind of a paradox. So it's paradox. just wrong. Like people are just wrong on all people counts. People are just wrong and people are afraid. I mean, you have this notion and it's half right that if you go with your child to be diagnosed for ADHD... If you only suspect, it's like 99%, they'll say, yes, this is what they have, and they'll medicate here. And parents are afraid of it. Parents say, we are not sure we want to medicate him. We're not sure this is what he has. We think, but we want to be sure. And and the feel, so from one hand, almost everyone that gets with a suspicion for being ADHD is being diagnosed with ADHD. And the other, there are people that don't come in. Also, girls are less diagnosed because they don't have the hyperactivity a lot of time in their Right. Uh, they just symptoms. have like different markers mm-hmm. to look for. So they're, do- they're not interrupting the teacher. So the teacher is not right. complaining. So it's kind of fall between the mm-hmm. chairs. Yeah, I, so because I, again, you know, I'm thinking back, I think one of my favorite TED Talks, it's like probably one of the most watched talks okay. that they have is Sir Ken Robinson. 
he's a educational expert and he and he did a lot of research on you know people who become hyper successful but how they became hyper successful how they became how they realized their genius and their their creative genius specifically and he you know he's involved in dance companies and all these things and he he tells a story about how he spoke to the uh the the choreographer who who choreographed cats okay and how when she was a little girl she was taken in to a psychiatrist because they couldn't control her in class and the psychiatrist to his credit said you know there's nothing wrong with her she's just a dancer okay <laughs> well yeah um my eldest was diagnosed with dyslexia etc and and one of his therapists said if we'll put in the first grade and second grade and second elementary school if we replace all the chairs with physio balls so the kids can bounce mm-hmm. on them when they listen will reduce the medication uh, rates yeah dramatically now, I don't know if she's right but there is something about it's very very complex to diagnose because kids are energetic right and kids are moving yeah. and they need you to be really interesting otherwise they look the other direction yeah. and it Of course, if you have ADHD, it's more, but all kids do it. So you need to have a precise way to diagnose. And the way you diagnose today, it's very, very subjective, okay? You start with questionnaires. Now, questionnaires means you ask someone how this child is doing. And we have these two amazing uh, examples from our uh, clinical trial. We had one girl that both parents filled the questionnaire for, okay? And... In one father and mother and in one questionnaire she has ADHD and the other she doesn't no weird who's wow. right because it's very much of how of perspective or of how you see her behavior yeah so this is one thing and the other one was a mother that fill up the questionnaire on her daughter and it didn't go we didn't get it in our system so she we asked her to do it again when she get in we got it so we had two versions and Same questionnaire, same mother, same child, five days apart, two different questionnaires. So, so it's like, it's so subjective. You ask the teacher to fill a questionnaire, which well, one? Well, I'm like, what did they eat that morning? How much sleep did they get? Yeah, how, how did your child react, I, was acting in this specific morning, not the whole month? You ask them to fill like on general, not just for this one day, but we're all human. And then you go mm-hmm. to a psychiatrist or a neurologist or a pediatrician. 85% of the diagnosis in the U.S. is done by pediatricians, not psychiatrists or neurologists. Wow. And then you sit with this doctor. Now, he sits with you for half an hour, hour, two hours. So again, and it depends on how he is this day. Does he have a headache or not? And on the child, does your child come tired and hungry right. or not? So it's very subjective. So a few years ago, lots of years ago, it was <laughs> obvious that you need something else. And the CPT, computerized test, was invented. Tova, Moxo, Cubitech, which made a change, made a difference. But they also have like a subjectivity issue. in them because you need to see something you need to understand it to take get to make a decision and press a button mm-hmm. so if you're a eight-year-old child tired of your parents taking you again and again to another doctor another doctor and you just don't want to participate in the game right. again you you know where you, when you need to press a button but you don't well I, I feel like there's also mm-hmm. going back to what we were saying before this this almost a prevalence of people who want to push you through the system maybe because the doctors themselves are a bit overworked I know in my own experience I, I you know I was given ADHD medication at a pretty young age and I remember even as a kid telling my parents I said you know that guy just met me mm-hmm. like what does he know exactly and I, I I don't really think they are overwhelmed as much as they have these tools that are not sufficient I mm-hmm. mean doctors want to be uh, good at what they do they are good at what they do they want to give a precise diagnosis they want to help they want to give you medication if you need it you know uh, 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 some one in my neighborhood in my kibbut said I don't want to take my child to be diagnosed because I don't want to give him these drugs that alter his mind mm-hmm. and I said if your child were diabetic and will say you he needs insulin mm. you'll give it to him right and he say of course and say 
okay, so if he really have ADHD, it means that the transmitters, the neurons in his mind are working differently than the way they should. I don't know, better or worse, but differently. So this medication only help him do concentrate and do the thing that he's supposed to do. The same way insulin help his pancreas. So he said, yeah, but if he has diabetes, we know, we test his blood, we see it. And with ADHD, how can we be sure? And I think this is the main question. How can we be sure? And this is, attention is a physiological trait. We should de- test for it as a physiological trait. I shouldn't be asking all these people mm-hmm. how the attention level, I should test for it. I shouldn't ask the teacher, the parents, the child, press a button. I'm asking him to, 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 do the, to perform the test. I, I'm measuring part his attention and part his motivation to do it. How, what, where do you stand on the use of pharmacology versus attention building exercises? Because I know that there are ways to train to lengthen your attention span. Okay, so of course there are ways because people with ADHD that don't get medication, mm-hmm. they make for themselves their own ways to cope and to, to I use sticky go notes around and reminders. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah lot, everyone has it, their, own, <laughs> on, their own way to, to deal with it. Now, the, I think the real beauty of what we're doing is that we're not saying we're treating ADHD. We're doing three right. things. Okay. The first thing we're doing is detecting it physiologically. We're using auditory stimuli. We're having a five-minute test that measures your brainstem reflexive response to auditory. Wow. Now, if it's reflexive, you can't really manipulate it. You can't change it because you feel you are a student and you really want to get Ritalin for your test. Right. You know, <laughs> it's reflexive. You can't. You can't tell your brain, your STEM brain, how to react. And if you're a child that don't want to be diagnosed, you can't really, you know, change it. We measure a reflexive response, make it accurate, physiological, and objective. Now, so this is how we help the diagnosis. And to get the right treatment, first you need to get the right diagnosis. Okay? Right. And after we get the right diagnosis, we can test you before and after you take your medication or have your treatment, okay? If you do a 10, 10 session with someone that give you tools to change your uh, uh, your attention, etc. So if I can test you before and after your treatment, it doesn't matter what kind of treatment you're doing, if it's medication, if it's CBT, if it's anything else, I can say is there a difference? Is there a difference between the test before and after the treatment? And if mm. there is a difference in your attention level before and after the treatment, then the treatments work. And mm. if not, not. And when we talk about medication, then I can say if the, this specific pill change your attention or not, and if it change it too much, if it brings you to the point of every parent's greatest fear, I have a zombie kid. You know, that was like me. It shut him completely down. So yeah. we can test. We can see it in a five-minute test. We can see if it just shut him down, this child. And then we can say, come on, you need to adjust it. It's not that he's listening. He's just, uh, he's sitting quietly because he's not with us. Who's going to be administering this test? Like, where do, do they come to you? And, and again, this is for diagnosis and then also for treatment, for, treatment. We, uh, uh, optimization, treatment optimization. Okay, right. so we do diagnosis, we do treatment optimization, and later on we can do monitoring. Because uh, right now, as I said, we measure the reflexive response of the brainstem. The way we do it, we put two EMG electrodes under your eye. It's with stickers, no needles, <laughs> doesn't hurt, it's great. It's five minutes test. And we measure the micro movement of your obicular muscle, the muscle that make you blink. Uh, yeah. And we're working now on getting the same data with a camera. So once we can get this data with camera, we can have an app, a mobile app that uses your own headphones and your a, a camera in your cell phone and do the test at home. So now you have a monitoring tool because kids, they grow. Their body mass change, their hormonal status sure. change. So the way they react to medication change. Mm-hmm. So every three or four months, they need to go and see that the medication still work. So instead of going to the doctor, 
at this point, two years from now, they can do it in, at home. The result will go to the doctor who knows if he needs to change the medication or not. So, so diagnosis, optimization of treatment, and then monitoring. So have you, what's the reason? Speaking of the mic. What is the, um, I guess, the results of your research of he, margin of human error in this versus the old way? Okay, so we have 83% accuracy when we compare ourselves to the old way. But having said that, everyone knows that the old way have some mistake in it. So I don't want to be 100% correlated with it because they get it wrong sometimes. So it's a bit hard to say how, ma- how wrong or not wrong I am with the general population. But one thing I can say that uh, a lot of time when we check kids that are diagnosed with ADHD and are marked uh, non-responsive to medication, in our system, they come out without ADHD, which explained to me why they are not responsive. And a lot, of, and wha- another very nice thing that our system can do, it can give you, we can detect other conditions. Uh, like we can see differences between children that have ADHD and children that have PTSD. We are located in your arm. It's in the Gaza, st- Gaza surrounding envelope. Yeah. envelope. So we have, unfortunately, a lot of kids in the area with PTSD. And we were working with uh, uh, psychological, uh, psychological uh, advertising, the service service there. Mm -hmm. Sorry for that. (laughs) (laughs) uh, (laughs) It's not my cradle tongue. We're all here. (laughs) And and there are kids that were diagnosed with ADHD and treated for ADHD and they knew they all were also have other conditions, which we call comorbids. Uh, things comorbidities, that are sure. Comorbidities that are related. And, and then we come and we say, you know what, we don't see ADHD, but we do see something else. It looks like PTSD. We don't have the enough how numbers you, to say that yeah, we detect Yeah, how do you get PTSD? like a baseline? Like uh, yeah. what's, what's the, yeah, like what's, what's the control? Okay, the control is a child, same age, that is actually doing fine, that has no, you know, he's just normal mm-hmm. child that no one is saying. But he I, I, so, but, so that's, that's like the control for like a normal quote unquote child. But like, <clears throat> what about the, the comparison to a child who you know has PTSD? That you've okay. studied those kids with your with your tech as well. So so let me take a step back. We did the clinical trial with chi- children we know that have ADHD that are mm-hmm. diagnosed for ADHD that that are taking medication for ADHD. PTSD was one of the things we kind of stumble upon. We start working wow. and we found it out. So we are now working on establishing the clinical trial to understand the PTSD because we can see that our system gives us data about it, but we are, we don't have enough data to say this is a PTSD and this is not, but we do have enough data to say this is ADHD and this is not. And the other thing we're now, uh, we, we got from our clinical trials was there are another uh, conditions that a, lo- a lot of time comes with ADHD, which is uh, dysregulation, either emotional dysregulation, impulsive dysregulation. Now you can have ADHD with impulsive dysregulation, or you can have ADHD without impulsive dysregulation, or you can have just impulsive dysregulation without ADHD. So it's like a what, mixture. What what exactly is that the the dysregulation? Like what are those? What are the differences there? Dysregulation means that you are not regulated. And what do I mean by this? That the way that you react to a stimuli is not correlated to the stimuli. For example, you react to a low sound as high as you react to very high sound. You know, if okay. I if I give you so low like sound an and then higher sound and then higher sound, I expect you to react in a correlated way. You know, just okay. a small reaction here and then w- b- bigger reaction and bigger reaction. And it's like a child that sits in class, the teacher talks, someone is bouncing a ball outside. Now, it's not that it's distracting to him, it's that he hears the ball outside and the teacher, like they are just talking at the same volume, at the okay. same time. It's not that he's distracted by it. It's not, for him, the sensing, it's a lot of, it, stimula- it's a, a lot of stimulation, not in the, it's not that he can't be concentrated, but everything are, mixed with something that shouldn't be 
the mind shouldn't say this is very loud sound. Everything is mixed. So it's right. a, a bit of dysregulation. It's dysregulated. And it's different treatments at ADHD. It usually won't uh, uh, respond to uh, ADHD drugs. So you need to, to know. So and also this is I also something we can see. So once you have a differential yeah. uh, 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 diagnosis, again, accurate diagnosis means accurate treatments. So And then, it, I mean, it sounds like you can then take this test and once you get a baseline for all sorts of different issues then you can quantitatively test for that as well. I mean, because what you're saying, like with this dysregulation, the first thing that popped to mind was autism spectrum disorder. So we are Same. doing, uh, uh, our uh, partner in the university, uh, Professor Avi Avital, is doing a trial today, uh, research about how th- our, me- our system, our method, this measuring of the start response can wow. help with autism. Other things, we were approached by... Um, psychiatrists that are uh, working with people with major depression. They say also, your method of measuring the brain stem response can give me insight regarding my major depression patient and how the treatment I give them helps or not. So in a way, I think, you know, uh, psychi- uh, when you go to a uh, GP to, uh, to the doctor and he asks you how you feel, and then he sends you to do a blood test, he takes your blood pressure, he sends you to an EKG, he do an MRI, he has like all those tests that he doesn't ask you how you feel anymore. He gets this objective data, and then mm-hmm. with knowledge of how you feel and when it hurts, and when and how and how much it hurts, he gives you a uh, diagnosis and a treatment. And when you talk about mental health, a lot of time it's all about communication with this person that you're yeah. treating and a lot of time you don't have an objective test and I think our test is like a blood pressure test for mental health like if you take your blood pressure test and you're a 27 year old pregnant woman it will tell your physician something something and but if you're a 70 year old man with uh, oncology background your doctor from the same blood pressure test gets something else. It can get, tell him something else. So this is our test. We have an algorithm that know how to take our result and say what is your attention level. But in the future, we'll have algorithms that will, can, that will give phys- psychiatrists data about depression and sleep deprivation and PTSD, wow. et cetera. So now we're focused on ADHD. The other thing, you know, once I can measure someone's attention, it's not only mental health. I can measure a combat pilot's attention before he goes on a mission. Because when you're very tired, your wow. brain acts like you have attention disorder. Wow. So I can measure what we call fit to operate. Your status right now, can you perform a task if you're a truck driver and you have to go from one side of the U.S. to the other side and drive for four days? So there are regulations you need to stop every six hours. Right. So this is being adopted by, you know, I guess other industries and companies to test their employees. So this is what we're working on. We did a test. We did two uh, studies, one with the Israeli Air, Por- Air Force and the other with a big hospital in Israel. And we test, for example, uh, interns at the hospital when they start their oh, shift and well, after and 26 Israel, yeah, years exa- they after were 26 hours yeah. and in the middle and we see how their attention level goes from here to here from up to down wow. so if you have a doctor that need to go into an open heart surgery that takes 10 hours you can check his attention level beforehand you know mm-hmm. so less mal- malfunction malpractice etc and I think when you talk about High risk, high attention professionals because there are other, there are professions that need high attention. Like if you are making um, I don't know like some, some, like something some, small, but yeah, something like very it, small. Yeah. But they are not risky. You know, if you right. make it wrong, you you'll do it again. But there are professions that are high high risk, high attention, mm. and our test can give you a specific measurement of the attention at a specific time. Now. About what you say before, how do I, what do I compare you to? So right. the first time I test you, I compare you to the population. 
I have okay. a so big where do you data. Fall on the bell curve? Yeah. Where are you following the population curve? Yeah. But after I test you four, five, ten times, I I have a biomarker of your attention. So I can tell you your attention is 80% low than your best, or is 20% low than your best. This mm. is the best attention you ever had. I can give you a biomarker of your own attention. Let's talk athletes. Mm. Uh, if you have a big, you know, I don't know, you're a quarterback, quarterback in the NFL, <laughs> and you have like the championship game, I know nothing about sports. <laughs> <laughs> my, my husband really tried to explain it to me, but I'm <laughs> Go on. <laughs> I just know balls are usually round, and then you have football. So, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. So, no, so if that. you're yeah. an athlete and you tested yourself in various times, I can tell you your best attention level was after you slept for seven and a half hours and had a big wow. meal with a lot of carbs. I don't know. This was the best attention level we measured. So you know, this is what you need to do before your big game or before your, before wow. your Olympic games or I don't know what. So the fact that we can measure your attention level, it can change the world. It can change the way we right. treat kids with ADHD, diagnose and treat, and this change million of life. It can change the way we... Uh, think about work safety, safety and your readiness to perform a uh, dangerous yeah. task. It can change the way we do sports it, or evaluate if we can or not do anything. It's really so, like unlocking a different level of life. Seriously. <laughs> well, and like I, this. So here's my my messed up brain is the cynic in me is taking this to the extremes of like almost control like like subliminal messaging and marketing to the worst degree right like is it possible that this kind of technology that this kind of measurements could be used nefariously for lack of a better word like to be like okay how do i grab people's attention more and distract them more or i don't know oh well there's a lot of research about <laughs> tension and attention <laughs> and how do you how do you get attention of people you know like you have Marketing people, they have like masters. Uh, how do I get people it's attention? Scary. So I don't tell them how to do them. I right. can just only tell them if they succeed in doing it. But, uh, but <laughs> well, that I mean, are, that's, let, that's the same thing, really. I mean, that's like test results. Like, you know, is what I'm doing working? Exactly. Now, let's say uh, you want to be a combat uh, pilot. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I can say that most combat pilots I tested have a very, very high level of attention. So you say, if I'll say, you don't, they can use it as a way to say, oh, you can't be a pilot because you don't have enough, the attention level is not good enough. Mm -hmm. But it's not true because I'm telling you your attention level. And if your attention level is, and there are pilots that have ADHD, but they are right. treated correctly. So with the medication, sure. they reach this attention level they need. So I can tell you what your attention level is. And you can decide if you want to do all this, uh, what we talked about before, you know, like improving it or if it's enough. Or I can just tell me you what it is. Now you can do sure. with it whatever you want. And we talk about attention. We talked about my kids earlier. Right? Yeah. So I have a 21-year-old, so he's in the army, Israel. And let's say he comes home after three weeks. He wasn't home. God knows where he was. God knows how much sleep, sleep he get in this Right. Three weeks. And he comes home and he say, Mom, I want I want the car. Can you give me the keys? I want to drive two hours to meet a friend in the other side of the country. <laughs> now, I... <laughs> I mean, jeez, really? So if, as I said before, in a year and a half, two years, I have it and it's an app on my cell phone. I say, you know what? Just take a five-minute pass, pass the test and then Let's we'll see. Let's see how is your attention <laughs> level. And if your attention level is low, do me a favor go to bed, take a good shower, go to bed, sleep for four or five hours, take the cars, go. I mean, and when we talk about professional drivers or young drivers, right? this is like the two well, groups. And they're like distracted are, to yeah. begin with. Yeah. So, so it's important. So as I said before, you have the mental health world and you have the safety world and the home safety, the work safety. And the mental, mental health world, it's, it's AD, we start with ADHD. This is 
our entry point because we right. have so much data about ADHD. Okay. But is we, that is that why you started with ADHD? Because it seemed like no, the, just no, no, no. Actually, this method was developed in the Technion by, as I said before, Professor Avi Vital and our uh, CEO, Zev Brand. He was uh, working with Avi, and they develop and they were working about these crazy things, other things, you know, like taking rats and learning their reactions to to things and really and Avi had 12 years of research in the Technion about human attention and about how you can measure it and about how you respond to okay. startle so kind of like the startle jump. response what we talked about the auditory response is a startle response and how it correlates so these 12 years of research and the researchers research that the Avi did together they realize they have a method to quantify attention. Now, if you can quantify attention, it's a deal breaker in so many fields, as we say before. And after we start the clinical trial for the ADHD method, then we, and other people use, do research with startle response on schizophrenia and autism mm. and the major depression, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a known a scientific uh, uh, com- uh, uh, data that startle response, a brainstem startle response can be an indicator for different mental health conditions. Mm-hmm. But there, no one ever made a, a method out of it. No one ever could purify it into a method. And the other hand is we need to measure, as I said, micro movement. And what we've developed is two things. We developed a device that is like, the most sensitive EMG system out there that don't use needles, that is non-invasive. So we can measure this micro movement before, because, and we can do it in five minutes with a specific sound uh, uh, protocol we developed and get the result. And then we develop the algorithm that understand this result. So wow. this was the core of the development. The device and the algorithm together create our system, create our method. And from this, it can take us to the other things. Wait, so again, maybe I, I forgot, maybe you mentioned this before. Okay. Maybe I have a little bit of ADHD. Yeah, everyone um, <laughs> a little bit. Um, how many times do you do this test on somebody to kind of get their pattern? Okay, so first of all, to for the di- you do one test to get diagnosis. Mm-hmm. So we say, come to the clinic, to the clinician, like to, to your uh, doctor, Make sure you're not hungry, you're not too tired, you know, and just let's take a baseline. And this baseline g- tells us first and for, foremost, do you have a do you have an impaired attention or not? Mm. Now, uh, this will help the uh, psychiatrist or the the GP or the pediatrician or whoever to decide if you have ADHD or not. And if he decides that with all the data he accumulated and our test, you have ADHD, he want to treat it. Now, when he treat you. Then the other thing we can do, uh, treatment adjustment today can take from three to six months. And it can be a terrible process. If you're very lucky, it happens fast. But usually you take one uh, drug, you take it for two or three weeks, you come back, you say how you feel, how it affects you, and then you adjust the dosage or not, and uh, or change drug, take a different pill, and again, try mm-hmm. for three weeks, see how it works. So it's a long process, it's very tedious. And what we're saying is, come in the morning, do one test without the pill, take the pill, wait for an hour, do another test. Now, I can tell you if the, this specific pill in this specific uh, uh, dose helps. If it's uh, uh, improved your attention, didn't make you a zombie, didn't do anything, it, and now you can try this drug and see if the side effects are reasonable. Mm. And you don't just need to, because we can say, and then in three days come and try a different pill, and we can say this one worked better than this one, so let's try to play with the doses of this one to get the best results. So we can shorten this from six months to two weeks, the optimization of treatment. This is really important. So this is the second, so first time you get tested to be diagnosed, and then you have two or three tests to get your uh, prescription uh, correctly. Mm-hmm. If you are in the other world of uh, safety and work, then you take a test. Let's say every time you come to your shift, and the, 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 and 
And the system study you. And after three or four times, she start to give you the result compared to yourself. If you're a driver, the first time you take your test, you start your uh, drive. It gives you a number like compared to the population. And then after six hours, you have a mandatory stop. And this mandatory stop is for two hours, but you take a test. And might I say, you know what? Your attention level is still fine. So you take your two hours stop and you continue. But maybe my test say, you know what? Your attention level is 80% less than what we did mm. at the start. These two hours won't do anything. You're going to crush this truck in three hours because you're too tired. You, right. so, so take a longer stop and then continue. Sleep a little. Don't just drink coffee, but take a nap. Mm -hmm. right. And then after another six hours, take another test. I mean, so, and then after a few tests, I have your mm -hmm. biomarker. So it's different. So I, so I want to ask you a little bit about, about you. Like, how did you get involved with my intention? Because I know, I, like, I, you know, I see on the website some of your work history. I saw that you come from, like, public affairs from and from research and uh, these kind of <clears throat> I kind of weird say, crossroads of, of things that led you. Uh, I don't know who I talked to, and I said... I have the tendency to reinvent myself every four to ten years. Like, <laughs> really. <laughs> maybe you have ADD, like long, ma long ma ADD. Long, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. It's not really that I get bored, but I can't. Well, it started with the fact that I was married to someone that was in the army for many years. So we moved mm. 11 apartments in 24 years. Wow. Okay, so I mean, that's in Israel. I really don't. I don't even think that's that weird. Like my wife and I, we've been together five years. I think we've had four apartments. But all of them where? In the in the center. Okay, Somewhere so in the, I like in lived in uh, twenty four years of marriage. I lived in Ovda, which is near Elat, in Ramadavit, which is in the north, yeah. in Tel Aviv, in Rehovot, in the U.S. <laughs> oh <my goodness>. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we moved a little, and every time we moved, I needed to reinvent myself. Mm -hmm. And I found out that it was challenging, but really fascinating. So I got a lot of things not done, you know, like I worked in, uh, well, well uh, I, work, I was in the Israeli army for a lot of years, and then I was in, the, I worked on uh, public affairs, as you, as you say, and mm -hmm. a little bit in the consular section in the Israeli embassy in, uh, in the U.S., and then there is where I learn how to find my way in the bureaucracy uh, maze. You know, like. Do you have any tips? <laughs> be patient. I still, I still haven't figured it be out. Be patient <laughs> and be persistent. Yes. Well, uh, the persistency I get because you know that's like because you're saying patience, but then I talk to like my mom and my aunt, and they they say you know like in Hebrew la forta shulchan to flip the table. And this w usually won't work. It won't work. Won't no. work. S saying it's someone that spent some time on the other side of the table <laughs> won't work. <laughs> uh, you're just, you're just what about them crying? Off. Does that crying work? Crying sometimes <laughs> work. Only uh, 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 crying sometimes work. And also, what works is uh, empathy. Like I know you have right. a lot of work. Uh, I sure. know yeah. you are swamped. And you know what? These people usually are swamped. And oh, everyone. Yeah feel like their case is different and their case is really important and they, their case has to go first now. So a lot of people coming in and giving their sobbing story. So you start to treat with them and all the regular files get pushed down and down again and again right. and again and again. So yeah, so uh, patience, empathy, and uh, stamina. A, wait, so again, okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> that and and then I did oh the, the, yeah so yes, this is uh, right. that, and then I did some research on biofuel saving the world and then I went back to university and there I worked on diabetics and on, on diabetics diabetics and then on uh, cancer research well, it really world saving yeah and but in a way it was uh, you know first of all at one point you understand you know cancer is such a big task yeah and uh, it's it's so hard to 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 tackle it and and it will take us time 
And the, and from the I other hand, it's, it's hard on the spirit, I imagine. Yeah, and from the other hand, when you do it in the uh, university in the academia, you do such great work, but sometimes it comes out as a paper or as an article in a, a journal, and it doesn't go be, go out and become a medication lost. or right. you know because. Now, taking it and making it f- as something that you can use takes years of m- research and money. And it, it was very, for me, it was like, wow, we have such nice result. How can we take them and do something good to the world? How can we do something with it? Right. And in the academy, a lot of times is we do research for pure research. Someone else will take our knowledge and do something with it. And I needed to do something with it. Well, and that, that's what I wanted to ask. Like, That's something I think I've noticed a lot with with uh, pharmaceuticals in general if it doesn't make money right then there's then the interest isn't there in the investment so a cure for cancer might not be at the top of the the Of the list for a pharmaceutical or company. even a cure for AIDS which I feel like we do have a treatment for it and like it's well just very and that's no, it like uh, a treat I don't know. It, but and then I look at like my intention by by comparison and that's like you know you're talking about how revolutionary it is but it also seems like it it's gonna be you know uh, um, like successful economically and scalable so that's like that's the difference mm-hmm. I think that uh, it's helpful but also you One of the things I like about my intention is that from one hand it has this huge market both mm-hmm. mental health market ADHD market which are huge 10 percent of the world population are estimated to have ADHD which is wow. like wow and on the other hand you have all these safety uh, uses and all this uh, I don't know uh, um, sports uses it also will bring money. But we also have, and this is something I really, really like about my intention, we have impact. Right. Okay, so, and there's a lot of talk about impact today. It's uh, all the innovation, like, do you have impact? Do you do good to the world? So when you talk about work safety, you do good to the world. When you talk about ADT, you do good to the world because we're talking about kids. And, you know, we talked about this, zombie kit condition mm-hmm. so if you're 14 or 15 you come home and you tell your parents this medication makes me feel dead inside so I'm not taking it anymore and you're not taking it and you're dealing with it, your ADHD the best that you can but you're not taking it because it makes you feel dead inside but if you're six or seven or eight you don't know that this dead feeling is wrong mm-hmm. everyone were telling you that something is wrong with you Your attention levels are not okay. You shouldn't be jumping up and down. Something is wrong with you. This medication will make you better. So you take it and you think this is how everybody feels. This is mm-hmm. better. Mm, wow. And a lot of si- times they don't even know how to tell you they, they yeah. feel dead inside because they don't know it's wrong to feel this way. Everyone told them wow. it will fix you. So knowing how to diagnose and tell you This treatment is not accurate for this child. It will make a huge difference, huge impact on their life. But it takes it even further. It's funny, but there are places that you have 15 and 20 percent of the children in the class uh, with ADHD and other places that only two or three or five percent. How come? It's not really that some population have more ADHD than others. Is this the environment versus nurture? environment versus, versus nature. nature and also how accessible the diagnosis is mm. okay how accessible is for you how a lot of time it's money in the US it cost fifteen hundred dollars to get diagnosed properly were well, they <laughs> proficient God. now most uh, uh, public health care system know how to treat they know how to give the The drug. The drug is usually in most of the public health care system. It's not expensive. It's okay. But the treatment process, it takes money and it takes time. So a lot of underprivileged or low socioeconomic or, or places, this kid just won't get diagnosed. So you have high dropout rates from schools uh-huh. because they just can't sit in class. So if I have my test... with a camera as a five minutes test that we're doing with camera not with EMG and we can put it in every elementary school so you have the school nurse that gives vaccines that do hearing tests that do 
uh, uh, eyesight uh, screening, mm-hmm. hear screening, etc. She also do a five-minute test on all the first and second graders mm-hmm. for ADHD. Now, if you get the markers for ADHD in our five-minute test, you get a letter to, to your pediatrician. And he can do the rest and decide if you need treatment or not. So by that, we can do impact on these places wow. and do yeah. less dropouts. You know, government puts lots of money in the uh, education system in low socioeconomic uh, uh, places yeah, to try to the even the places. odds, to try to even the odds for them, but they drop out. So if 10%... The money's not spent right. So if I can diagnose 10% saying they have ADHD, they're not listening to all the money you're pouring here on education, mm-hmm. give them the right medication, they listen, they won't drop out, your money is better use. And you can give a little bit less of it even maybe. Yeah, and in <laughs> other... I mean, you just you spend it the right way. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in right. other in other places, I say, come on, don't overdiagnose, don't drug everyone. These right. kids don't have ADHD. Maybe he has something else, maybe he has some emotional problems, uh-huh. treat the emotional problem, don't drug him. I mean, That's so incredible. this is what I said before, overdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, at the same time. Mm-hmm. All right. That, I think, is a wrap. Uh, again, this was actually serious. I'm Aaron Porras. I'm here with Dr. PhD Hadas Shatz Azulai. <laughs> Thank you. And Hannah Rifkin, my wonderful producer. Uh, and we'll be back soon with more on all things Israel, including artificial intelligence and Israel's national security, cyber defenses at public hospitals in the face of ransomware attacks, and much, much more. So stay tuned. And of course, don't forget to keep up to date with the podcast and tons more content by subscribing to Actually Serious on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, No Camels, and www.aaronporus.com because we believe in connecting the world one incredible human at a time. We love you. See you next time. Mm, don't take your headphones off. I need a picture sitting <laughs> and doing a podcast. You yeah. see? I, I, I'm a, so I, I have a tent. No. All our shows and podcasts available online on our website and on all podcast platforms. Search Audioversity 